This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Coming to you live in this holiday season as we wind down 2019. Two guests that I've really enjoyed in the past, and I want you to reconsider these conversations. Robert Sutton and John Gordon, two very positive guys with positive messages. Now, they say their messages in a little bit different way, but their attitude, their insights, their wisdom. Man, this is the kind of stuff you need as you head into 2020. Let's jump right in with Robert Sutton and John Gordon. Our guest today is Bob Sutton. He is a professor of management science at the Stanford Engineering School and a researcher in the field of evidence based management. Bob lives two different lives from my perspective. The very serious Stanford professor and the really cool side persona that he has developed, side authorship. His first famous book, The No Asshole Rule, Building a Civilized Workplace and Surviving One That Isn't. That was 2007. But today, in 2017, his follow-up, the Asshole Survival Guide, How to Deal with People Who Treat You Like Dirt. What a great excuse to use the word asshole on this podcast for the first time. At least, I think it's the first time. I know there is ample swearing on this podcast, but I don't believe the word asshole has been used yet. At least not in an interview. I hope you enjoyed this great conversation with Robert Sutton. Speaking of like kind of unforeseen things to happen, I mean, when I look at your resume, you've been at Stanford for a long time. I think the early eighties. Yeah, you've got a bat. You've got a ba- years. Okay, <laughs> you know this is a, this is serious stuff. I've been to Stanford's campus. I mean, you know, it's a great place. Very serious academic institution. Uh, you know, your background: organizational psychology. Uh, you're in the management, teaching management. Take me back ten years ago or so, roughly, as you were putting your first interesting titled book out. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the use of the word asshole, because I got to tell you, I mean, it's the guy who's written books. I, I can only imagine what would have happened initially when you first put this across serious publishers' desks. As you say, it, it was just an accident. What happened was, and it was, um, I'm part of an academic department but it, uh, that's called Management Science and Engineering, but we were merged out of existence. We had another department I was part of that was merged out of existence called Industrial Engineering, and we actually had a no-asshole rule. I was kind of used to that. One thing that was a really important fact was in the early 2000s, my wife was actually managing partner of a large law firm. I was living in a no-asshole rule environment, and she was managing assholes. So we kind of had a lot going on with that. I wrote this little essay for Harvard Business Review. What happened was Julia Kirby, who was my editor at that time, she kind of calls and says, uh, so we're doing something on management breakthroughs. Got any breakthrough ideas? I said, well, I have an idea. It's called the no-asshole rule, but it's not a breakthrough. My father told me about it when I was a little kid, so I don't think it's new. And you're too wimpy to publish the word asshole anyways in the Harvard Business Review. Well, so I wrote this essay. They called it more trouble than it's worth. I don't remember the exact number of times, but I put the word asshole in at least 10 times on the theory they would cross out almost all of them, and they left them all in. (laughs) So this is 2004. I got so many emails, and I probably that was probably by then my eighth, seventh something Harvard Business Review piece. And usually you get like five emails and one speaking gig that falls through. That would sort of be my average HBR article. 200 emails, all these stories. So I realized there was a market there. So I wrote a book proposal. Ironically, 
Harvard Business Review said they would take the book, but wouldn't take the asshole title. The, I had a, a editor call me in my my you've written books before, so my you know my literary agent put the thing out for bid. Then Warner Books, a guy named Rick Wolf, calls me up and says, "Hi, I'm the asshole who bought your book." <laughs> and uh, that's it's been sort of all gravy from there. And and it is kind of funny using the term. I mean, I, I don't I don't even swear very much in class anymore at Stanford. I learned that some people are uncomfortable with it. The reason I was so insistent on using the word asshole, both in the last book and the new book, The Asshole Survival Guide, is that when I see somebody um, treat somebody else like dirt, that's the word that comes to my mind as a sort of self-control mechanism. When I'm bad, I say, Bob, stop being an asshole. And, and apparently I'm not alone in this in this regard. So and that's sort of how it came about. It was an accident. And, and, and as you say, I continue to do work on organizational change and innovation and leadership. But the asshole stuff does come up and I it, it is a problem in organizations. It almost feels like uh, I'm going to make this kind of a silly analogy to a superhero alter ego. It's almost like you have this one world that you're in and you've got this kind of side project over there that you're now known for. You have these two different personas. Is that a fair assessment? Well, sometimes it, it feels like that, although sometimes the worlds do collide. I'll give you an example since uh, there's a lot of discussion in the Bay Area about Uber. And my last book was actually on scaling, spreading excellence, and they really are an example of an organization from what I can tell from the outside that uh, has both asshole problems and scaling problems. And the asshole problems are caused by scaling too fast, perhaps by um, an asshole being in charge. I was going to say, it might, it might have some of the CEO as well, huh? From what I can tell, that might be part of the story, but, but part of the story also is that they move so quickly. And, there, and there's a number of other startups that have gone through this phase, by the way, including Microsoft at various points that scaled so fast that they, uh, uh, another one is called the HubSpot, I think, that, that they just didn't have time to get anything resembling controls in. And it turns into this sort of Lord of the Flies situation. That, and then they got, they got to kind of get things under control. It, it is a, I mean, there's other things that cause it too, but it isn't just as simple as having an asshole in charge. Sometimes it's just people who are busy and look the other way. Let me start to tear this apart here a little bit and get people into your thinking. For example, you know, I've got in my hands here the, the asshole survival guide, which is the, the follow up to the no asshole rule. This is the first time actually on an interview I've had a chance to use the word asshole in five well, thank years. Thank you. I'm so. honored. <laughs> I'm, You're way I'm, ahead of the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened when you put the book out? You put the first book out, and if I'm not mistaken, 800,000 plus copies, maybe over a million by, the, by now, who knows? But it's a huge number for a book. I mean, it's crazy. I was shocked, and certainly my publisher was shocked. I don't know what happened. but The bank accounts were not shocked. Those were good. <laughs> so, so the thing that was most surprising, though, and, and who knows what will happen with this book, the, the book sold in the United States market about 100,000 copies the first year, 2007. The most shocking thing was how well it did in translation. And if you've ever done translation rights for your books, you'll you'll see that you get I, I, I a couple, couple thousand copies here is a lot. But it, it sold really a lot in Europe, especially in Italy. The first year it sold 133,000 copies in Italian. Wow. Wow. So I, and so I went. And I visited Italy, and the other thing about this, actually, actually, kind of in some ways surprising and entertaining, is that most people have the same reaction that you do to the book, that it, it, to the word that it's both sort of silly, but it's also serious because it is a very serious problem. We can, we can talk about um, how much damage people do to people who treat others badly, but in Italy. They were very serious about it. I mean, I would do things like I would have panels with the, the minister of labor and, and senior politicians and, and business leaders, and they were very serious about it. The thing that I also have subsequently realized is that the reason that it's a serious problem and it's also sort of funny is that, I mean, people make jokes about it. And, and I, you know, I get all sorts of asshole jokes. Like there's one in the book that I still love, which is that if you're in a room and you don't see an asshole, that means it's you. I mean, things like that. People tell me jokes like that constantly. You know, are you an asshole magnet? Things like that. Is is that it's dealing with people who make us feel demeaned, de-energized, disrespected, which is sort of the way that I think about assholes. It's a problem for all of us our entire life, dealing with bosses, dealing with friends, dealing with roommates. If we look at the evidence, especially in the last years that's piled up, is that uh, when people make us feel bad about ourselves in that way, it actually has all sorts of negative effects. So it's a serious problem, but it's also something that people joke and laugh about because that's one of the ways they can survive it. 
No, it's a serious book. I mean, this is not, you're right. I mean, this is, it's a great title. It's catchy. I'm sure plenty of people, perhaps in an airport, did not understand the seriousness behind it. There's a lot of scholarly research behind what your where this book goes and probably just picked it up for the title alone, you know? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Let me go into that Italy thing for a second. It's really curious. You know, I know with translations of titles, book titles, at least in my experience, you know, they, they often change these things. The, 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 foreign, the foreign publishers will change the titles to, to something they think is, uh, is, is better. Was the translation in Italian, for example, was it one-to-one -one in terms of the word uh, asshole? Oh, so this is a great question. With every country, that, so I hate to say it, but there's almost a one-to-one -one correlation between the, <laughs> the dirtier the title, the better it's sold. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my Italian's terrible. So some Italian listeners going to correct me, but the the Italian translation was matado anti stranzi, which the literal literal translation is apparently the method against shit. So that's what <laughs> that's what what apparently in Italian a stranzi is sort of like a piece of shit. So that so the, so it does make sense if you're you're Italian, and and my French is terrible, but apparently the French title was really really strong and it had every synonym for assholes in the subtitle. And so it sold well in France, but I'll give you an example of one where it didn't work in Spain. So my Spanish editor wanted to call it El Stupido. And I had this whole army of Spanish speaking people who all thought that was ridiculous. And he called it El Stupido and it sold badly. And he wrote, later wrote back and said I was right. So, so the translation does matter. Let me offer for the audience really quick, a quick reminder that you are currently a professor of management science at the Stanford Engineering School, and you have a PhD in organizational psychology. So we are Joking around a little bit, we're going to get into the depth right now, but this is a really serious subject, as you've hinted at. What I want you to kind of paint the picture for is you, you put this book out initially 10 years ago, all these great sales, all these great translations, and you've already started to hint at this, the feedback. You've got an, an absolute ton of feedback in what you've been doing for the last 10 years, even though this you've not been like, you know, concentrating on this for the last 10 years alone. You set aside the last year to get this done, the new book, but Talk about the feedback and the volume of feedback. Well, so this is one of the weird things that happen is, okay, so I put the book out there and I would, well, every cocktail party, every social event, people will tell me their stories about the difficult people they deal with. And I, I'm a psychologist, but I'm not a therapist, by the way. So it's sort of challenging sometimes. The number of emails I would get, and as I say, the, the big motivation to write the book, the first chapter is called 8,000 emails, was just this deluge of people having talking about their issues. And the range of people were absolutely stunning. For some reason, priests and rabbis I got lots of emails from priests and rabbis, uh, well, about uh, from from priests and also um, a, a Baptist minister about asshole parishioners. That's actually a big issue. Then I get emails from school teachers about their asshole principals, from principals about assholes parents. I mean, it was just coming from all from all different uh, directions, and then from the U.S. Army, just almost anybody who you can think of, legal secretaries. It, probably the I, the the sector of the economy where I got the most number of emails, requests, and conversations was healthcare, because if you think about how healthcare is organized, it's very hierarchical. There's a lot of uh, time pressure. There's a lot of sleep deprivation. Those are some of the elements that really do breed nasty behavior. So I would say if you want to turn somebody nasty, give them power, put them in a hurry, and make them sleep deprived, and you will get a nasty person. There's a big question people are asking you, and I'm quoting you here. Is essentially, people are saying, help, I'm dealing with an asshole or a bunch of them. What do I do? The last book, the, the, asshole, the No Asshole Rule, was about how to build a relatively asshole-free workplace. But this one really zeroes into your point on the question you just described. And, and it is something that people ask me every day. And to sort of divide it up, since I am an academic, if you look at research on the effects of people who leave us feeling demeaned, disrespected, de-energized, people who say, gee, that, that person's an asshole, the evidence that it's bad for us and bad for our productivity is so strong now it's really hard to find a peer-reviewed study that does show that um, when, you, when somebody does that to you, you're less creative, you're less productive, you have start having trouble sleeping. And if it's just a short little encounter, there's all these research where there's short little encounters. Just one study they did in Israel, they'd have an American doctor allegedly call them and tell them how dumb and incompetent they were. They do a worse job on a, on a task where they would uh, try to uh, diagnose and figure out what's wrong with a little baby. I mean, all sorts of evidence like that. But the other side of the equation, which is what the book really focuses on, which is, okay, somebody's making me feel like dirt. What do I do about it? 
There's a lot of studies that hint about what to do, but it's a little bit like uh, practicing marketing or, or how you start a company or something. There's some science and there's some craft. So that's where I'm between the two. I try to draw on peer-reviewed research, but sometimes uh, it isn't there and you got to sort of go more with the craft and the stories. So I combine the two. I've been thinking about myself recently, and I, I've, been, I've been trying to prune people from my life. It's really kind of like fortuitous that I, that I get a hold of your book. I haven't been defining what I'm trying to get rid of exactly, but I'm trying to get rid of assholes. That, that, and, and, and I think we're all working on that. And one thing in that feeling, so, so at least I won't speak for you, but when I say I'm trying to get rid of assholes, one, and this is one difference also, one thing that has evolved over the last decade is that the people who I label as an asshole are people who make me feel bad about myself. Other people, they may not bother. But part of the thing about, to me, living the no asshole rule, dealing with assholes, is you've got to kind of be aware of, of who makes you feel bad and who doesn't, and maybe how you're contributing to the problem, too. But still, if, on the pruning part, if somebody's making you feel bad about yourself, I think that's a good reason to get them out of your life if you possibly can. Yeah, I, I'm 100% with you. Let me go big picture here for a second. Some people are probably already having some thoughts in their head and they're probably thinking to themselves, you know, I know a lot of winners in my life. Or for example, I think I've heard stories about Steve Jobs or the, the former CEO of Uber. It seems like to me that there's an ungodly number of winners who are assholes. So Bob, you know, tie this together for me. It seems like sometimes these assholes are winning. There's two parts of it. First of all, whether somebody is a, wins because they're an asshole or not, they're still bad for your physical and mental health and productivity to deal with. So it's going to be bad for the people around them no matter what. Uh, Steve Jobs and Travis at Uber, it was not easy to be around them. If you actually look at the evidence about who gets ahead in the workplace, there, there's actually – and there's a guy named Dr. Keltner at Berkeley in particular who has studied this and also Adam Grant, University of Pennsylvania. And, and what it sort of looks like is it's sort of a chicken and egg problem, which is that the question of, of who gets ahead, in most situations, people who get ahead – are people who treat people nicely, but then when they get in positions of power, they get worse and turn into assholes. There, one place I confess that there might be some exception is in entrepreneurship in the very, very early days where you need somebody really focused and driven. But if you look what happens, you look what happened to Travis and also Steve Jobs, and I talk about this in the book in uh, the first few pages, is that um, so when you talk to people who know Steve Jobs well, and the person I especially quote is Ed Catmull, and I'm doing it with his permission. Ed Catmull was president of Pixar. He, he met with Jobs every week for 25 years. I don't know whether Jobs was not an asshole when, when he became famous, but the argument that um, Ed Catmull makes, it, Ed knows a lot better than I ever did. I met him a couple times, but was that uh, Steve Jobs only became the Steve Jobs who got rich, got famous and everything after he got forced out of Apple. He failed at Next and actually uh, failed at um, the early days of Pixar for years. And Ed argues that um, although Steve could still be very pushy and very argumentative, he was a much better team player, much more empathetic and much more caring person. And that other Steve Jobs, although he could be difficult at times, um, was the one who, who really got famous. So he argues that the story is distorted. Now, other people might have other perspectives on Steve Jobs, but I thought that was an interesting counterpoint. And I would add that there are plenty of people who have gotten plenty rich without being assholes. Mark Benioff from Salesforce is a good example. I already mentioned Ed Catmull. And Warren Buffett's a pretty good example, too. Even though I might be able to kind of find the assholes that were winners, from a psychological standpoint, if you're in their orbit, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, you, you, can, you can kind of like... Uh, uh, you know, be stuck with the devil thinking that it's going to rub off on you and you're going to become super wealthy too, but your your mental functioning might just go down the drain as well. Well, yeah, well, that's that's one also a, a characteristic of uh, of people who are assholes that even they're successful, they do go through lots of different people. The, the other thing I think is actually really important for us to discuss, because in this conversation, we're and I fall into this quickly, we're acting like there's these good people and there's these assholes, right? But I think that the truth of it is, is that most of us under the wrong situations are capable of being assholes. And even, and I, and I talk about this just a little bit in this book, but in the last book, I talked about it much more. There probably are situations where leaving people feeling demeaned and de-energized 
might be to your advantage. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example, and there's actually an, a, an article, just devastating article in the Sunday New York Times this, this weekend about, about a woman whose ex-husband had died from uh, complications from drug overdose. He was a lawyer at a large law firm. And she talks about the notion that, that uh, you know, one of the things that you hire a lawyer for is to be your asshole, right? Not so much in business law, but in litigation where it's a zero-sum game, you're paying your lawyer to make people feel demeaned and de-energized and to push other people around. That you know, and, and that's what they always say. Maybe you've heard the expression, he might be an asshole or she might be an asshole, but it's my asshole. And people like that who are in occupations like that, it's really tough because – and this is a classic problem that lawyers have. And my wife managed a large uh, law firm, had as many as, as 1,000 lawyers for eight years. I know about this problem. The, the, the challenge of them being able to turn it off when they talk to staff, when they talk to colleagues, really tough problem. That's interesting because I, I can think of many instances over the years where I've had counsel and I've watched them in action. And I've just said, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad he's on my oh, side. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the ones you want. So, <laughs> right. And, 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 that, and that's why I go to this thing of feeling demeaned to de-energize. If it's a zero-sum game, if it's a one-shot negotiation, then probably having somebody like that, it actually, it actually might work. But to the extent you have cooperation or it's a long-term game, I talk about this feeling to me to de-energize, but I mean, there's a great book called Give and Take by, by Adam Grant, who I, somebody I really admire, and a good friend of mine. And Adam shows essentially that if you're a taker and you just want to screw people in the short term, that's a pretty good short-term strategy. There's no doubt about it. But over the long term, his argument, and he has good data, is that people who are takers, I mean, who are givers, who help others get ahead, that because of the accumulation of failure of favors, people feel like they owe you stuff, that they tend to do better in the long term. And, you know, to go back to Steve Jobs, I mean, one of the things about Steve Jobs, it was really complicated. He was such a complicated person. If you were close to him and something was wrong with you, he was amazingly giving uh, one of one of uh, a, a dear friend of mine, David Kelly, who's uh, the founder of IDEO and the Stanford D School. He had cancer at one point. And, uh, and, th and this was when Jobs was in the absolute glory years. The, the iPhone was just coming out. And Steve would go to the Stanford Hospital every day and, and show his love to David Kelly. And, of course, one of the ways he would show his love to David Kelly was by yelling at the nurses on behalf of David because he has Steve two jobs, right? So this idea about exactly what an asshole is, is uh, what, one other thing that I also like to really emphasize is that we tend to people think uh, – sometimes we meet people who have kind of a rough exterior who might yell a little bit and think of them as assholes. But I talk about these people who are porcupines with a heart of gold. There's a lot of people in the world who are a little bit rough to take when you first get to know them. But the longer you get to know them, the better person you realize that they are. So it's a little bit complicated to unearth them. You're getting to a point that you make throughout this uh, newest work, which is uh, being slow to label people assholes. And fast to label yourself because – Unfortunately, great evidence that shows that we human beings have terrible self-awareness. The worse we are at something, the more we overestimate our talents or our, our abilities. So if you think you have really high emotional intelligence, you might not, it might not be so true. So yeah, and, and, and one of the, the other things that I emphasize in the book is that uh, the most reliable way to figure out whether you're an asshole in the short term or the long term is to uh, have people around you who will tell you the truth. One of my uh, favorite stories that's in the book and I just have ever seen, there was this point right at the darkest point of World War II where Winston Churchill's wife, Clementine, wrote him a, an e wrote him not an email, I was saying exist, wrote him a, a, a long letter in which she told him that he wasn't being very nice and the pressure was making him, uh, was driving away the members of his staff. The side effects that was interesting, she pointed out the side effects were that um, if he continued to berate them and be nasty to them, they would be afraid to tell him the truth and the whole nation would suffer. And this idea of having um, somebody in your life who can tell you the truth when you're being nasty or being incompetent, it's one of the greatest gifts that we all can have. Let me slide you into depression. Because, you know, this is something that we would not maybe intuitively think at first. And I would like, you've kind of, you've kind of hinted at it in this conversation so far, but there's good evidence out there that a lot of people that might otherwise be suffering from what people might call depression could literally be their environment, their environment of people that are assholes. 
and this is one of the cases you, you, you can generate helplessness, sadness, frustration, just in a short laboratory study where somebody is rude to you. I mean, people will try less hard. They'll start feeling helpless. But if you look at the long-term studies of what happens when people um, face extended bullying, to your point, depression is a very common effect. Uh, there's even long-term studies that if you've got a boss, especially in the Scandinavia, if you've got a boss who's both incompetent and nasty to you, your chances of having heart disease are higher. And, and one of the things, and this, of course, we all know this is linked to anxiety and depression. One of the most consistent findings we, we see, especially with nurses, for some reason, there's a lot of studies with nurses, that if you have a boss and colleagues who treat you like dirt, you will you tend to start having sleep problems. So, yeah, to your point, you know, if, uh, if, you, if you want to get depressed, find yourself an asshole boss and colleagues. It's a pretty reliable way. You know, you've got some techniques that you, a lot of different techniques you cover in the book. But one of the first things you talk about is like when you're trying to assess this situation, I'm in some work environment, I'm dealing with someone. How dire is the situation? How do people begin to determine? Because we talk about being slow to label the asshole. How does one determine this, this level, the direness of the situation? I would sort of just pick on three different things. One thing is just how much you're suffering. I mean, the worst shape, that, because it, it is one of those things, is how, how bad you're feeling about yourself to me. That's the first one. The second one is, uh, is essentially how much power you have. Because uh, although, you know, power is kind of a double-edged sword, it's something that can turn you to an asshole. But if you're being pushed around by people where you have power against them, either because you're a hierarchical position or because you have a bunch of allies, and this is really important, if you're being attacked by an asshole or a bunch of them, if you've got a bunch of friends on your side, you got emotional support, you got people to help you document what's going on, you're in much better shape. You have people to go to, you know, just to complain. And, and, and then the last thing that I would really look for is that there's some situations where you might just have one stray person, hopefully who isn't too powerful, who's being abusive to you, and then it's not so bad. But if you're in a situation where it's a s systemic disease and everybody around you is treating one another like dirt, well, two things are going to happen. One, you have nowhere to hide, so you're going to have more and more uh, problems. The other thing is, and I talk about this in the book, repeatedly, and we have really good evidence of this right now, is that if you're in a world where everybody acts like that, they aren't going to change, you aren't going to change them, you're going to, you're going to become like them. This, this notion that negative emotion is really, really contagious, uh, it's really dangerous. So one of the most reliable ways to become an asshole is to go hang out with a bunch of them. You know, there's a, there's a line that you have in your work that I just love. It resonates with much of the work that I do in kind of investing writing, and I can see it in venture capital. I can see it in a lot of different walks of life. You could see it in dating and you could see it in relationships. You have this simple phrase, which has just struck me. And you, the way you highlight it in the book, uh, you know, it's, it's meant to strike me. I believe in quitting. Oh, yes. So yeah, because the, what is it? The Vince Lombardi thing, you know, winners never quit. Yeah, I do believe in quitting. And it's funny, you were talking about uh, sort of ending relationships or earlier. Yeah, there's a good argument. If you can get out, get out. And, and there's all sorts of evidence. We know this in our lives with bad clients, with bad bosses, all sorts of evidence that, that, that when there's somebody in your life who makes you feel terrible or a bunch of people, just getting away from them is one of the best things you can do for yourself. And, and one thing I do emphasize is that you got to be really careful about uh, just uh, doing the old take this job and shove it routine is not a good idea. There's all sorts of evidence that people quit like that, reduce their employment prospects and make um, enemies that hurt them. But getting the hell out is uh, it's really an important thing to do. And one thing, since uh, you and I probably both have clients, that's there, there's also this notion that if you've got a client who's treating you like dirt, if you're really, really dependent on them, on them you might have to take it. And uh, the last thing I want to do is send people in poverty. But uh, lots of evidence that people fire clients. I mean, we see all what's going on with the airlines right now. One thing that isn't coming up very much is, and I know this especially from Southwest Airlines and JetBlue Airlines in particular, but most major airlines do have this thing where if you treat people like dirt and you're a consistently abusive passenger, you're not allowed to buy a ticket. To me, that's part of what it takes to deal with, with nasty people is, is, is to be able to be ready to separate yourself from them. You know, it's an interesting thing you bring up the airline, and I'll go off on a side tangent here, and you might run with it as well. So I, I told you I'm in Asia, and I travel back and forth between the states. I often fly on the Japanese carrier ANA. It's a, a beautifully serviced flight. It's just fabulous. I, I have done 
flights to and from Asia and the U.S. And, and what people might not understand about what does, it's a seniority system. Those flights oh, are worth system. Right. Those those flights are worth the most. So they get literally the oldest people. I've had grandmas in business class serving coffee over top of me with their arms shaking like they have Parkinson's. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with grandma having Parkinson's and I might have it right now for all I know. But the point being is that, you know, you this the, the airline situation is really an interesting microcosm of where you can see all these different things uh, butting up against each other. But and if you think about it, if 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 you want to create assholes. I mean, if you want to, if you want human beings to be bad, what do you do? You put them under pressure. You create status differences. You make them a little bit anxious because they think they're, you know, because of the fear of flying. It, it's unbelievable. So, so th there's an interesting study. This actually isn't in the book, but, uh, but there, there, one of the, one of the researchers who is cited a lot in the book, her name is Katie DeSellis. She's a professor at Toronto at the Rotman Business School. She did the study that shows that, that when there's first class and business class in a plane, there's more likely to be air rage by both people in first class and business class. And in particular, I love this in the airline, in the airplanes where you walk through where people in coach walk through business class and they see it, the people sitting there with their little drinks and fancier big seats, it's especially likely to happen because it gets more vivid. She also did some research called on fights before flights. And she found out that, the, of course, the longer the delay, the more likely people are to yell at people uh, who work for the airlines. But she also found that screaming babies were one of the things that really caused people to go off. So she, all this sort of crazy stuff. But, yeah, it's a, airlines are a terrible situation, and they keep putting more and more pressure on us and crowding us, and, and it keeps getting worse. I hope that it starts getting better. You just hinted at it, and I think in post – on this interview, I think I'm going to beep out the mention of the one carrier that I just said something bad about. <laughs> yeah, you probably should. Uh, uh, I, but that one carrier, I, I, I think it's important to beep out stuff. I actually have, I start out a, a chapter in my last book about how bad it is. So uh, I, I'm on the record. So do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to beep them. <laughs> we got to protect our, our clients. So let's go. And that, for, that's, go that's, another, that's another aspect of this, though, is that, and we could just use airlines as a jumping off point, but you know, when you have a situation where you know you're being treated badly by assholes and, and you can't do anything because you literally have no other option, and there's probably many more examples than a flight, but for example, going to the U.S. Post Office, I can pick on them. The government's not going to come <laughs> after me. Okay, but if I go to the U.S. Post Office, generally the customer service is is not going to be what you might see in the private sector. There's a little more edge to them. It's tough when you have to deal with assholes and you can't get around them. The post office, I think that the main hope, I end up going to Federal Express, but that's not that's not a very good solution. Sometimes you have to go. But let, let's back up and talk about clients, though. One of the things that happens with with, uh, with clients and customers who are assholes is that that they that might sort of help them get the message, or if they don't, will make you feel better. And, and I call this asshole taxes. But in every in every occupation I've known well, if you are somebody, in, 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 by the way, especially law firms and professional service firms. Firms, and I, I've, I won't name any professional service firms, but this applies to every single one that I know, that um, if you're a client who treats people badly, a couple of different things happen. One is that uh, people will hesitate to give you the service that you start demanding, and this especially happens to law firms and uh, the major consulting firms, is, uh, well, so if you got a nasty client, who is going to end up with them? Is it the partners and the um, and the younger folks who are great, or is it the ones who are weaker and don't have any bargaining power? You end up with weaker help. And the other thing that happens is this thing I call asshole taxes, which is that there's a lot of situations where people will charge you more money just because you treat them like dirt, uh, and they do it as a way to sort of make themselves feel better. So if you're an asshole client, you may be paying for it and not realize it. To add to the thing on the airlines, though, too, look at the kid that was just flying from uh, Seattle to Beijing. And they had, you know, the, so look, it's not, it's not just, for example, airline staff being assholes. It's passengers on airlines oh. being assholes. It's, oh, yeah. it's, yeah, it's the full circle. It's, everybody has the potential to go after everybody else. And, and one thing I will say about about pilots and about most people working on airlines, they are remarkably patient given how horrible the situation yeah, for sure. is. You, for you sure. have to 100 percent give the, you know, it is funny. So so a friend of mine is I gotta be careful how I identify her, but but she's a, an executive in an air in an airline and she's been in the business a long time. She says that one of the most important 
important things, and this is about cooling people out, and this has got to do related to one of the things you do with the assholes, is, is she says what the best captains will do when things are going south, when the plane's on the ground, or even if it's in the air, because, you know, they can, they can uh, walk out of the cockpit, they'll walk over and gently talk to folks to just sort of calm them down and how effective it can be. Even in that case, you can have uh, people who engage in leadership and cool folks out. But you, so you were, you were asking about different ways, if you're stuck with assholes, what to do about them. In the workplace, one of the things, and I've got a chapter on this, is, is uh, the way that I, I think about um, essentially people who are toxic. It's, it's, it's like this thing that, it, it's like a disease that you can catch. And, and there's actually some great research that shows that if you are within 10 or 12 feet of a toxic coworker versus 25 or 30 feet of a toxic coworker, you've got about twice the chance of not of turning an asshole yourself and of getting fired as a result. It literally is a disease. If you can create some distance between yourself and them. Another thing that I sort of learned about dealing with assholes, and I talk about this in the book. Can, can, can you pause for one second, Bob? What you, what you just said though, about it being a disease, I, I don't want you to jump. I want you to continue and move to the next point. But we could probably literally what you just said in that one tenth one sentence. We could talk for hours about it being a disease that literally travels from person it's to person. A, it's a contagious disease, and you, you can catch it from other people. You can obviously give it to other people, and it's also a disease in that it makes you sick, and you can pass it on, on to others. And and one of the things that that I suggest to the extent that you can is if you can walk out of a situation. Obviously, you can't. Um, jump out at 30,000 feet, but maybe you can move your seat, maybe not. One of the other things that, that I always suggest is that uh, is that if you have somebody who's a, who's a known asshole you've got to deal with, try to meet them as re- with them as rarely as you can. I talk um, about somebody whose name I can't I can't use here or in the book who had she was she had a, a really terrible dissertation advisor who would call her and send her all these nasty emails, and she learned this rhythm thing, which was. When he would send a nasty email or, or leave her a nasty telephone message, she'd wait longer and longer and longer to respond just to sort of slow the rhythm. So that rhythm stuff's really important. I, I recommend, if you can, uh, avoiding meetings with them, walking out of meetings. Well, one of my favorites, and this is a story that's the end of, of one of the chapters, there's a woman I know who was uh, a CEO. So th- there's some discussion in the book of board holes or douche boards. So it, 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 we tend to think of CEOs as, as being all powerful, but if, at least I'm in Silicon Valley. You talk to the CEOs here and they'll talk about how nasty their boards are sometimes. And there's some really horrible board members. And so she had this board member who used to scream at her, literally scream at her for 15 or 20 minutes. So she'd always talk to him on the telephone. She wouldn't meet with him in person. And she did this thing. I just love it. She would she would turn the the volume down on the phone so she couldn't hear him scream, and she'd put her feet up on her desk and do her toenails and just occasionally turn the volume back on to let him know he was there. And after he'd calmed down, about um, after about 15 or 20 minutes, then she'd kind of talk to him. But I just love the image of, of the CEO with her, foot, her feet up on the desk, painting her nails, pretending to listen on the phone. And to me, that's doing what you can to avoid having the force of the toxins be quite as strong. Taking those examples that you just mentioned, let me reduce it to a line from your book, which I really love, which is, I think I want to put this up on my wall, quote, don't engage with the crazy, end quote. (laughs) From Katie DeSellis. Yes. (laughs) She's a famous, quite famous researcher. So yeah, if you can avoid, but sometimes you can't avoid it. Yeah. Let me shift it to something which I think is, we're kind of talking about the interpersonal. So much of us today, and I've got niece, two nephews, they're basically early teens, and they're going to be going through a life that's quite different than perhaps the one that you and I have seen. And so much of their their asshole conflicts are going to come from online. Now, I'm going to get it in because I feel like is a serious book and is a serious guest, and you referenced this uh, great blog passage that I re- went and read from David Kendrick, but I felt like I felt like I need to be able to get this for the first time in five years on this podcast. What makes a fuckhead? Right. I felt like you know. So, so I felt he like wrote that in 1994. Yeah. You're talking about the earliest days of the web, and he, I mean, he was. Remember, there was message boards. Probably, yeah, yeah, some of your yeah. listeners aren't old enough to remember. I, I mean, I have children who are adults who weren't born in 1994. And, That's a timeless uh, piece, by the way. Timeless. I, it's unbelievable. So one of the things about what makes, you know, if I had to use the term, that – and the evidence is actually – you and I are even in danger now because, you know, we're, is that any time you're in a situation with somebody, even when you know them, if you can't make eye contact with them, 
that's when the risk goes up. It, mm. it, you can see that there, there are some people, and by the way, I would include myself, my biggest asshole moments tend to be over email because I'm a writer and you know, and you don't see their eyes and you get blah, and you start getting pissed. And that's one of the biggest, the biggest risks because anytime you have eye contact, it's really, it's really a problem. So if you look at the modern world that we live in, this, this isn't just, this isn't just the problem of strangers. It's that um, when we are in work situations where there's distributed work, there's distributed teams that once we get an email, our chances of, or any sort of texting, anything, Facebook, where you can't see their faces, it's, we're really at risk. One of my favorite examples, I, I had a student who was in a, a group, a, a platoon in Afghanistan, it was about 25 or 30 um, folks, and, and they just had an intranet. They didn't even have an internet because they were just out in the middle of nowhere, out in the country. And he said, every night we would go to sleep and we would go into our foxholes and, and our um, bunkers and stuff, and we would start communicating on the internet. And by the next morning, we'd all hate each other because they'd all start writing nasty messages just because they didn't have eye contact with one another. So he, I remember him saying that, that his commanding officer told him they couldn't send um, messages anymore because it was just undermining the morale and um, interpersonal dynamics. And to me, that's sort of a microcosm of that problem. But yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not going to go away. But one thing I think that does happen to most of us that there's some hope for is that we all start getting more experienced at both when somebody's nasty, just cutting it off, and when we're nasty, the next time we see somebody apologizing, but it's, it's really, it's really a tough problem. It's a worldwide problem. Let's keep it on the online for a second. Cause I think you and I are in a situation where there's some element of public figure. If someone Googles me, they're going to find a lot of stuff that's generally positive over the course of a career. It can be the same for you. It's kind of like a wall of defense to some degree. So if somebody wants to troll you, if some asshole wants to troll you, and they want to say the worst things under the sun, well, it's going to kind of be diffuse. It's not going to really get to the core of, of Bob Sutton. It's not going to get there. Kind of same with me. However, if you're just a regular person, you get into, you know, you're on the, you're online and you're social media and stuff like that. And all of a sudden you get caught in the crosshairs of trolling and perhaps it becomes mob trolling. Perhaps it gets really asshole terrible, perhaps even beyond asshole. That's a really difficult situation to be in because there's nowhere to run. And when those trolls start going after you, if you are kind of a private figure, all of a sudden it's the only thing Google sees. Yeah. And they don't know anything. You have no allies. It's just terrible. And, and, and by the way, that a microcosm of that does happen. And that's where you get, you know, in, in high school, and, and this used to happen on Facebook, where both my kids went through this, where somebody would just be attacked at night on Facebook, and, and it would just be terrible. Yeah, so that's where the mobbing really comes in. And, and, and to your point, if, you, if you're if you not a public figure and just one negative thing comes out, it's really a problem. You know, and by the way, even for semi-public figures like, like us, there's certain things that I, and every now and then I make a mistake and kind of blow it. I, I try to avoid two things. I try to avoid talking about politics because honestly, you know, in the here in the U.S., things are so divisive that if you start taking one side or the other, I don't think people can even process. They get so nasty, and and I'm a I'm a political person privately, but but publicly it just doesn't help. It just everybody just gets so hostile about it. And then the other thing that I try to do is when I disagree with somebody to try to disagree with them politely. But but I've noticed every now and then I've had to withdraw a tweet or something that I've sent out because I didn't mean to be nasty, but I might have gotten overly nasty. But I got to go that example of the private person that, that in, in, encounters the the trolling assholes. Is there any good technique other than avoidance and just kind of hoping over the there, even though they don't have a news cycle, their private news cycle, 24 hours that it will go away? Or I mean, you know, cause that can really damage folks. And I've seen it happen to them. In that situation, um, if you can't find some allies, I mean, the, ev the evidence is all you can do is is to block people, unlink them. And, that, and this is where the self-control part comes from is just don't look at it. And, and, and this, is, this is one of the things that just taking yourself off of Facebook or Twitter, if you start getting in the middle of one of those storms, is probably the best. It, 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 to me, it's the moral equivalent of quitting a job, right? Or leaving the room. That unless it's so severe that like the, the news media is coming to your house or something, then you're really in trouble. But if you're just in the middle of a storm doing all you can to disconnect and remove yourself from the situation might be the best thing you can do for your mental health. Because to me, it's the same as walking out of the room where, where it's nasty.
When people think about where we're going today, and we've kind of been fun with the term and everything, but at the end of the day, you know, people, they're not to blame if they come into contact with these assholes. It's not us. It's not, it's not you. It's, it's the asshole. And you've been talking about this throughout our conversation, but I think it's really important to discuss the idea that you are not to blame for the asshole. Well, and if you can't get out, and this is, I've got a chapter on, uh, I call mind tricks, and, and we haven't taught talk much about fighting back. There are times when you really should fight back, when you can fight back. If you think you've got a reasonable chance of winning, if you've got a posse, if you've got evidence. But there's also times when um, you're just stuck in a bad situation. I've, there's one woman who wrote me I, a lot of email interaction with her. She was working, she was clerking for a federal judge. She was a lawyer. And she had clerked a year before as a great experience. She had this just judge who was constantly screaming at her. And then her coworkers her fellow clerks, they caught the contagion. They were screaming. It's just a nasty situation. And she just had to get through the year. And, I, and I, my first reaction was, why don't you quit? And she said, well, I've got student loans. And if I bail out of this clerkship, basically my career is ruined. So you know, what do you say to somebody? It's like, so you just got to take it. And, and, and this ability to ha- find it in yourself, to have some emotional detachment. What, one of the techniques I especially like, which is quite evidence-based, is especially if you're somebody like a clerk like that, to remind yourself that a year from now, this will be in the rearview mirror. This isn't going to last forever. Try to engage in as much emotional detachment as you can. Where I work at Stanford, most people are pretty civilized, but we have our share of assholes too. And uh, one of my favorite administrators, he has this thing. What he does is when he's in a meeting with somebody who's really nasty, he pretends he's a, it's funny because he pretends he's a doctor who studies assholes and it, and what a fascinating case it is. So, so he uses this, which is a detachment strategy I use too sometimes, sometimes more successfully versus less successfully, but that ability to sort of detached and, 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 and feel sorry for the person and maybe even try to convert them. Cause sometimes when you deal with somebody who's nasty to you, they might not realize the harm you're do, they're doing to you. So sometimes you can reason with them. Sometimes you can gang up on them and fight back. There's a lot of times, you know, for all of us are going to have some people in our life who just drive us crazy and leave us feel hurt. And the question is, is to how not to suffer damage. Yeah, that fighting back part, it, it's often about the timing. It makes me think of like classic books like Sun Tzu's Art of War. Right, right. I mean, you really, it, it's, it's, it's not something sometimes just the, the, the immediate counterpunch to an asshole or a troll is, is often not the best uh, strategy. And that's a great. In fact, there's a story I tell in in the book that that I I went to in some detail, but uh, I, I could have written pages about this. So so once I was at this conference, and it, it was for, it was for uh, people who uh, ran community colleges, big conference. And this guy describes to me this entire like sort of seven part act or whatever of how they got rid of their abusive chancellor. And this guy was a severe narcissist, really severe. And and if you know anything about narcissists. Anything short of brown nosing, they need constant flattery. That's what they need. So, so what he and his colleagues just they just kissed his ass constantly. But the, but while what they did was they built a case against him and, and brought like the whole board of overseers or whatever it was together, and they just got rid of him really quickly. But he said we kissed his ass till the minute he got fired because we knew that was our only our only hope. And and I have a couple of reactions to that is one is it's actually kind of sneaky and kind of sleazy. But on the other hand. When you have a narcissist, if you start challenging them and telling them the effect on you, what you end up with is somebody who hates you. So that was one of, one of the sneakiest ones that I ever heard of. In, in other cases, it, could, it can be done more legalistically and, and the like, or it might be an organization where there's just an occasional asshole and you have power over them. But that one just amazed me. But well, we've given people a two, if they haven't read the first book, we've given them a two book assignment now. <laughs> but be, beyond your two books, I'm really curious if you would pass along to my audience, where is your reading these days? What's intriguing you, whether it's whether it's books or, or websites? What, what inspires you over the course of a week? Okay, anything by Adam Grant. He wrote this great book called Give and Take. There's a book, it's actually, it's still in the it's still just doing great. There's a book by a woman named Kim Scott, who was a Google executive. She, she was at Apple for years, and it's called Radical Candor. And, uh, and the argument is how you give break people bad news without being an asshole about it. And then she talks about this 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 notion of ruinous empathy, the, the problem of when you have people 
in your life, especially when you're a boss and you're constantly telling them how great they are and not giving them the necessary feedback. So Kim Scott's book, Radical Candor, I would really recommend. And just uh, another book that I think is still one of my favorite creativity books, Creativity Incorporated by Ed Catmill. And this one's really weird. One of my favorite books ever written, Guy's Long, Long Dead, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. It was written by this guy. I think his name in a minute. I've got to buy. I've got to buy that. I still don't have any idea what it is, but I got to buy that just for the title. It's a, it's about this guy who was the creative par paradox of Hallmark Cards, and it's about how to survive in a large, complex organization with some grace, and how to be a creative person. It's really an interesting, an interesting book. Gordon McKenzie. I just remembered his name. So Ed Catmull sort of gives the gives you the perspective on how you build a great creative organization or turn one around as uh, as as he and John Lasseter did with the Disney animation. Gordon McKenzie sort of gives you this crazy book with all these crazy drawings because he, he designed greeting cards for a living about how to survive with grace in an organization that uh, sort of kills creativity. And all large bureaucracies have these sort of natural forces that kill creativity in the human spirit. So that's that's just sort of my weird I, my weird sort of idea is uh, Gordon McKenzie's uh, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. Very short book with weird drawings. I'm up for it. And I, I'll recommend to you, if you have not seen it, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, a documentary about uh, this guy that wanted to make the film Dune in the 70s. It, it would have beat Star Wars to the punch for the first kind of s star fantasy film, and it didn't happen. Mexican director, fantastic documentary, really cool stuff. Sounds great. Um, it, has, it has nothing to do with our conversation, really, but I just thought of it. <laughs> hey, so the, the book, The Asshole Survival Guide and the original, The No Asshole Rule, Bob Sutton, everybody can find you at Stanford for additional work. And I'm sure they're going to go to Stanford and they're going to find all kinds of academic stuff that's going to make people think, hold on, was that the guy I was just listening to? Well, I, but I, I still am the asshole guy, so I'm both. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I, I have a new website, bobsutton.net, if you, it's probably the most efficient thing to send people to. It's got... It's got all sorts of different stuff. And my, my next adventure is probably around organizational friction, why it's so hard to get things done in organizations. So that's kind of the adventure I'm starting to starting off on a bit with my old co-author, Huggy Rao. I'm still doing other stuff. Well, Bob, I appreciate you taking some time today. Much fun. It's great, great to talk to you. And now for John Gordon, let's jump right in. My guest today inspires readers, no doubt about that. He's the author of 17 books, including five bestsellers. His very first one, The Energy Bus. My guest, John Gordon. I can't think of any cooler way to break into the space that John has broken into and dominated than going down the sports direction. I'm not giving away any hints yet. But this is an inspiring story. Inspiring to see John overcome obstacles, to see John push and strive and make it happen. We can all hope like crazy to look at John's work and say, why not us? Why not me? Why not you? Now, before I get into my conversation with John today, one quick reminder. My newest book, Trend Following, How to Make a Fortune in Bull, Bear, and Black Swan Markets, is now available in audiobook. It only took about two months extra time. Don't ask why. These things happen. But it's out now. It's 34 plus hours. Give me a break. You can drive across the country listening to that baby. But enough of my book promotion. And on to my guest today. What a fun conversation I sincerely hope you enjoy the perspective of John Gordon. So, John, listen, back in the day, I had a buddy of mine, and I don't know exactly how he did this, and I think it was for a Florida State-Miami game in Tallahassee. Somehow or another, this guy, knowing how the system worked, he found his way into the pregame speech that Bobby Bowden was giving to the Florida State Seminoles. He's sitting there with the team, the coaches, and Bobby Bowden, and eventually they just look at the guy and they, who the hell is this guy? Get this guy out of here. 
You, on the other hand, have figured out a, a more safe way to connect with the college football coaches of America. This is quite the interesting story. And I think we're, where I'd like to really dig into here is, is partly how that's happened. But you've got such a fantastic client, I guess, would be with the head football coach of Clemson. What, a, what an interesting story. And I don't know what the interesting story is, but I know there's something there. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I've been working with teams for years, even before Clemson. I say years, you know, uh, four or five years. I started, my first team was the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2007. Jack Del Rio was the head coach. He read Energy Bus. Mike Smith, who was the defensive coordinator at the time, gave him the book and said, you should have John come and speak. I didn't know Mike Smith, but I had a friend who knew Mike who gave Mike the book. Jack calls up. And I went down to meet with him, very intimidated. I was gonna, this to is, meet he's Jack. a tough guy, right? I mean, he's. Yeah, I mean, and a big, large mountain <laughs> of a man. I had never spoken to a team before, a high school team, college team. And now here I am meeting with Jack Del Rio. I just wrote the energy bus, thought I had something that could make a difference. And now I'm sitting across from him, and he's telling me about how the book really impacted him, about the message of positivity and dealing with energy vampires and negative people and so forth. And he said, Would you speak to the team? And I boldly said in that moment, I will speak to the team if you have everyone read the book. And he said, you got it. Done. I'll get it for everyone. He wound up getting the book for everyone in the organization, including the janitors, including the food service people. Everyone got a copy of the energy bus. And I went and spoke to the team. I was definitely nervous. I mean, at the time, Fred Taylor was on the team. Maurice Jones-Drew was like a rookie. I mean, these were guys who I loved watching play, guys I supported, saw on TV, and now here I am and speaking in front of them. Completely random. Yeah, just sharing my talk on, you know, the energy bus. I don't think I was even a great speaker then. I definitely wasn't actually, but I was on fire. I got fired up and just started talking about staying positive, dealing with the negativity, don't allow the energy vampires to sabotage or bring you down. It really resonated with it. And they had a great season. They went 11-5, and five, made the playoffs for the Jaguars. That was a big deal. And beat the Steelers in the first round. Mike Smith then became the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. He then called me up out of the blue and said, hey, you know, this is Mike Smith, you know, coach of the Falcons. We just met briefly because I think we just shook hands and that was it. He said, I want to do the same thing with the Falcons that you did with the Jaguars. And so I said, sure. So he got the book for everyone. Went to speak to the Falcons. Matt Ryan was a rookie that year, and Mike Smith was a, a rookie head coach. Spoke to the team and then did that every year for seven years while he was a coach until he got fired from the Falcons. But then I worked with the Texas Longhorns in 2009, the year they went to the national championship. Spoke to them because a coach had a friend on the team, uh, had, had actually a friend who was an assistant coach. He heard about it, brought me in, then worked with University of Georgia. But then what happened is, you know, coaches started to pass the book along. For some reason, it was a book that resonated with coaches. And then I wrote Training Camp with the best do better than everyone else, which is my favorite book I've written. It's about the winning habits that separate the best from the rest. So different coaches started reading those books. And then I started getting invited to speak to basketball teams, women's basketball teams, lacrosse teams, women lacrosse teams. And it's been crazy. I could never – anticipated that I would be doing this, but I do love it. I mean, I spoke to the Dodgers this year, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Miami Heat, and teams like that now. So it's really, because uh, it was just football, now I'm getting to speak to a lot of you know NBA and Major League Baseball teams. You know what's so awesome about it? Not just the content alone, it's the entrepreneurial instinct, smelling it out and, and getting that, you know, taking that first chance and jumping in, not necessarily planning it at all and just going for it and, and not at each one, each iteration that would come along and build on it. That's what's cool about that story. You just nailed it because it was just showing up, doing the work, not worrying about failing, just given everything I had, not knowing if it was going to be good or not, but then get invited back. And sometimes I'm surprised I am invited back, right? But just to do it and then get better and build. Now when I walk in with a team, I know what they need to hear. I know their challenges. And I can see how along this journey I've been prepared for these, you know, these bigger audiences and so forth. Okay, let's let's use a practical example and stay in the sports for right now because you – 
do have this, and I, I hope I don't say it wrong. It's Dabo Swinney, right? Dabo Swinney. Yeah, Dabo Swinney. Swinney. Okay, it looks like you want to say Swinney, but it's Swinney. We lose, he loses, his team loses the 2015 National Championship two years ago. They win it this year. You were involved over the course of the loss and the win? Yeah, I was abroad there to speak about five years ago. So I've been speaking to the team for the past five years. And what happened was Chad Morris read my book, Training Camp. I didn't even know Chad Morris. And he was at Tulsa at the time hired by Dabo as the offensive coordinator for Clemson. He goes there, gives Dabo the book. This is how weird this stuff happens. Gives him the book. <laughs> Dabo reads it, loves it. He starts sharing one of the 11 traits of what the best do better than everyone else. He's like, Clemson's going to be the best. And every week he shared one of those characteristics every week with the team for 11 weeks. He was sharing what the best do better. Now, I don't even know he's doing that, but every time I turn on the TV where I live in Florida, the Clemson games seem to be on the ACC network or whatever. I'm going through the, the channels and there's Clemson. There's Clemson. I'm watching these guys going, I love these guys. I love this team. Next thing you know, at the end of the season, they had a good season that year. They won 10 games. The year before they were six and seven, won 10 games. I get a private message on Twitter from Chad Morris. And he said, Hey, would you ever come speak to the team? We used your book this year. I'm like, no way. I've been watching you guys all the time. I love your team. And I never loved Clemson before in my life. And so I went and spoke to the team 2012 and I've worked with the team ever since. So yes, I was there in the locker room when they lost the championship and I saw Dabo give an incredible display of positive leadership because he didn't focus on the loss. He said, guys, I've never been more proud of you, of a group of men than I am tonight. You guys are amazing. I wouldn't want to coach any other team. You seniors, you've left a legacy, but you underclassmen get ready because we're coming back. And he proceeded to talk for about five to 10 minutes about how they were going to come back. They just lost the national championship and he was already pointing towards the future. I was blown away. I could very easily think, and you're going to have to educate me because I don't know the backstory, that perhaps you were able to give some piece of insight that helped after a big loss over the course of the next year coming into where just recently in this, you know, what, five, six months ago where they actually won it. But now if I go that direction, I can also very easily think that even the time they, they lost it. They could have won it, it, but but not for a coin flip almost. I mean, it was literally the luck of the draw. I mean, there's and and also when they won it, the game was so close. So you it literally could have been reversed. They could have won the first one and lost the second one. But was there some growth there, or was there something you were able to do to help? Tell me your view on it. Yeah, I take full credit for all their success. That's my view. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding because I I believe the complete opposite. It's funny because like I spoke to Clemson and then I also joke when I speak to audiences because I say, guys, not everyone I talk to wins. I spoke to the Cleveland Browns two years ago. So the one thing I've learned about is it's never the talk. It's never the book. It's always the leadership. It's always the leaders on the team, the leadership in the coaching room, how they lead, how they deal with adversity, how they come together as a team. Dabo Sweeney helped this team grow from that loss. He's an amazing, positive leader. I think there's very few things that I said that made a difference. I know training camp, being a part of their program was helpful. I know that teaching the coaches and team about loving, serving, and caring from the carpenter was very helpful. Dabo talked about that. He talked about his one word for the year. I did that with the team about having your one word and using that word to have more motivation and purpose. But Dabo had them do a vision board, each guy. They also had a lot of leaders after that loss that came back and said, you know what? We want to win another one. So they really had a lot of great leadership and team accountability. And then you have Deshaun Watson, who is the best quarterback in the country, the best gamer and a great winner, making that last drive. If he doesn't do that last drive, they don't win. So you're right. It could have been all these little things. So everyone looks at it after the fact, but it was a lot of combination of a lot of things. But the two biggest components, no doubt, were the visions, the vision that Dabo had, and the leadership and the belief, the belief in the players. And then the belief they had each other that, you know what? Yes, they just scored with two minutes left, but we're coming down and we're winning this game. And they just had this incredible faith and belief in that moment. Before I dig into some of the principles and ideals 
in your newest work, The Power of Positive Leadership. One more football type question, sports team type question. You've given some idea of the coaches and your connection with the coaches, but very often the coaches will know of you first, right? And they will then tell the team, hey, you got to know about this guy, John. I'm sure these are stud athletes, you know, they're, they're probably thinking, oh man, some of them are thinking this, hey, uh, whatever. I want you, if you can, are there, are there any names or any players, I don't care the sport, that you can think of when you walked in the room and perhaps they were a little skeptical and you gave one of those aha moments where they just paused, looked at you and you, you knew you had won over a diehard skeptic. Does anything jump to your mind for any of the players in particular? Well, I mean, I can't really talk about that from a personal mm. standpoint. All I can say is that... Describe a player without a name. <laughs> all, all I can say is that, um, you know, when you speak to Oklahoma City Thunder and the Dodgers and the Miami Heat and the Padres and the Pirates and you have Matt Ryan, the superstars, you have to win them over. Yeah, you know, you're mm. right. So regardless of who's in the room and... Even if the coach endorses me, there's some credibility because the coach is saying, hey, I brought this guy here, so there's some value there. Chip Kelly even brought me to the Eagles, and Tim Tebow was there, and Mark Sanchez, and a couple guys were there. And, and Tim came over to me afterwards. I knew I wanted Tim over because he invited me to a Bible study afterwards. <laughs> so that was pretty cool, and, and had a great talk with Tim after that. Really enjoyed our, our conversation. A great guy. So maybe that's something that you can point to, but... I do know that you have to win them over. You have to provide something of value that's going to make them better, that's going to help them grow. And if you can't, they're going to tune you out, and they're going to tell right away if you're full of it. And they're going to know if you're the real deal or not. So to me, you know, again, I've had guys reach out to me after the fact, text me, have begun conversations. I'm there to encourage them and help them. And those are the kind of things that come from those talks. Not everyone. Some guys might be rolling their eyes. There are always going to be a few probably. But for probably 90% of the guys, you know, buy in. There's maybe 25% that really buy in and they want to keep in touch with you. And, and that's something. And again, I don't charge these guys. It's just some that they'll reach out. I'll reach out, encourage them, and keep a, a dialogue. That's why, again, they're so, they're so private that I really can't share who – and I don't want to violate that trust. Let's dig into positive leadership. Now, people might hear that phrase immediately, positive leadership. They might think to themselves, well, come on, you know, all, all leaders are positive. I mean, but that's not the case. And I can think of an example, and I will try not to name names here, but there's a, a big ride-sharing company, and the CEO <laughs> seems to get mixed up in every bad headline in the world. And it doesn't seem very positive to me. But for the audience right now, for those that are hearing of you for the first time, why don't you lay out for us positive leadership, big picture, macro? Sure, and I'm glad we're moving into this because I don't just work with sports teams. I do work with a lot of companies and you know leaders of Fortune 500 companies. And I, it's funny because I actually do more of that than than sports. Sports are just what people seem to love to talk about. But in terms of um, you know positive leadership, to be a leader, a real and effective leader, you must be a positive leader. We almost shouldn't have to say positive, right? Because you have to be optimistic if you are a leader. You have to believe in a brighter and better future because that's what leaders do. They point people towards the future. You could be a visionary. Steve Jobs maybe wasn't positive, so to speak, in terms of his relationships, but he was very positive about creating a future that he imagined, that he the believed culture. in. The culture. And also what they called his reality distortion field, that time and time again, he was able to distort the reality of his employees because they said there's no way they can create the software in a certain amount of time. And he would always convince them they could do it faster. And they said time and time again, he distorted their reality from some would say pessimism or realism, I'm just being a realist, to optimism. And that's what positive leaders do. So first and foremost, they're, they're very big on vision. They see a brighter and better future. They lead with this optimism and belief that it's possible, right? We can do this. And then they also, though, 
deal with the negativity that exists. They don't allow negativity to sabotage their team. So that's something I wrote about, again, in this book and create a framework in terms of you got to address negativity. One of the biggest mistakes that leaders make is they don't address negativity. So being a positive leader is not about Pollyanna positive. It's not about thinking we're going to sing Kumbaya and hold hands all the time. So no, we got some real issues. We got some real challenges. We will address them. We will deal with the negativity, but we're going to do so in a positive way. And as we do so in a positive way, we then create a fertile environment now where we weed the negative, feed the positive, create an environment where everyone could do their best work. And then positive leaders do what they really do is they unite the organization. They unite people. They rally people. Alan Mullally, which I wrote about in that great and that is a great example in the book. And then they also connect with individuals. They develop the relationships. So this guy you're talking about, the rideshare company, he's, he's very big on vision, right? Excellent on getting a product to market. But I'm not sure I would describe him as a, a full-blown positive leader in terms of how he really approaches people and things, just as Steve Jobs maybe wasn't the complete positive leader. Positivity, though, is contagious, and, and that might sound to some people oh, hokey or something, but if you have a positive leader at the top who's pushing that positivity nonstop, 24 and 7, it does rewire the circuits of those underneath him, doesn't it? It, it does. And you're right. It is contagious in a positive way. And the research shows us to be true that, that our feelings transmitted by the heart are contagious. So you're broadcasting positive energy or negative energy. We also have research that shows that um, emotions are contagious, emotional contagions. So people are likely to catch your good mood just as they might catch your bad mood. That's important to know as a leader that you are contagious in that way. And so when you come in with this vision and your feelings and your emotions and your beliefs, those are contagious to the people around you. Leadership, I often say, is a transfer of belief. When Dabo Sweeney got the job at Clemson, he walked in the office, walked in the team meeting room, and he brought in two signs, one that said, believe, and I can't, with the T crossed out. And he built that program based on belief, saw firsthand how contagious it is. And people start to get the mission. They start to get the vision. They start to buy into the belief from that leader. And so you see it all the time in businesses. You see it in companies, in schools. You want to transform a school? Everyone's talking about transforming education. Bring in a positive leader as a principal, someone who can really rally the teachers, who gets them involved, gets them bought into what they're doing, get them involved in the mission of making a difference in kids' lives. You do that one school at a time, bring in a great leader, you're going to transform the school. Let me use Dabo as an example here, just since you mentioned him again. It wasn't that he got the job and walked into the room and everyone automatically followed him. It wasn't because he mandated, you must follow me. I am the hired leader. This positive leadership is, it's the, the people underneath the leader want to they want to follow. It's not just you can't command it. You have to become that someone that, you know, the people underneath you want to be like you. They want to be with you. Yeah, I love the way you just said that because it's, it's not something you can dictate. The dictatorial leader no longer works today. You have to be someone that they want to follow. And you have to, as Walt Whitman said, convince by your presence. And so through your positive energy, through your belief, you're convincing. Now, let's get something straight here, by the way, though. People are probably thinking, does this mean I have to be an extrovert? No, you can be an introvert and still be a positive leader. Your energy is still contagious. The love that you have, the passion or the mission that you're driven by internally is what people sense, is what they feel. Your integrity is contagious. So ultimately who you are is what people are picking up on every day and every moment. So that's what people need to know in terms of this, this leadership that truly makes a difference. I liked this phrase that I had never heard before in, po in the power of positive leadership, which is the caring trademark. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but you describe it as kind of that unique way to show that you care. What is that? What is that something, something? I, I mean, I, I care. I love doing this podcast. I'm at 500 plus episodes. I love writing books. You know, I love doing these things. I don't know exactly what it is or what I put into it, but I think you can, 
if people stop paying attention, they know you don't care. I think if you, if you do give it your all, but I, I, I was trying to think of that as like, wow, a caring trademark. That's really an interesting concept. Uh, speak to it uh, in your, your, how that came to you and, and perhaps an example that you could uh, help illustrate with the audience. Yeah. I started to think about like every great leader and company does have a caring trademark. If you go to public supermarkets, have you ever been to a Publix? Down in the South, I have. Okay. And if you ask someone who works there where something is, they're not allowed to just tell you. They have to walk you to the spot on the shelf and show you where it is. They're not allowed to say, aisle nine, good luck, man. They have to take you to the spot. So that's their care and trademark. They're known for that. Les Schwab Tire Centers in Oregon, when you pull up, they actually sprint outside from inside to greet you when you get out of your car at the tire centers. That's their care and trademark. I started to think of Chick-fil-A, which says my pleasure, not no problem. They say my pleasure. That's one of their care and trademarks. And so people have them as well. Dabo, for instance, he believes in his players more than they believe in themselves. Clint Hurdle, the coach of the Pirates, the manager of the Pirates, he's a just a guy who just loves his players like family. And they just know it. Some coaches like Mike Smith, he's a great listener. Like that's his care and trademark. He truly listens and his players know that he's always there for them with a listening ear. My care and trademark is encouragement. I love to encourage people. And so I know that anyone who reaches out to me, for instance, needs encouragement. I always respond because I want to encourage people. So that's my care and trademark. Derek Jeter with the Yankees. His last at bat was so special. It was a game-winning hit, right, in Yankee Stadium. But it was so special because he ran to first base every time, whether it was an out or a home run, like it was his last at bat. Every at bat he treated like his last. So he showed he cared. Doug Conan, former CEO of Campbell's Soup, he has written over 10,000 thank you notes to people he's done business with and to his employees of Campbell's Soup at the time. So that was his care and trademark is to write these thank you notes. Amazing. If you don't know what it is, I really believe you can discover it. And I believe your podcast obviously is one of the ways that you show you care. But here's the thing. We could tell when someone cares or not, right? We know right. when they care. They put their heart and soul and spirit and passion into it. I wrote about this in The Carpenter. You know, There's a difference between a carpenter and a craftsman. Carpenter shows up and just builds something. But the craftsman or the craftswoman, they put their heart and soul and spirit and passion into what they're building. Why? Because they care more. Now, look, anyone listening to you right now can feel the energy. They can feel the passion. And, of course, to go in and deal with corporate America and sports teams, you have to give that too. But I think, and I'm not mistaken here, I, I don't think I'm mistaken, I've seen you described, maybe this was a self-description, a 31-year-old, fearful, negative, stressed-out guy. <laughs> Is that, is that accurate? That was then, yeah. Now I'm 46, so that was a while ago. So what? Why was the, <laughs> what? What was going on at 31? What was the? What, what was? What, what was? I mean, obviously you're not there now, but it can be helpful for people to see. I mean, you describe yourself fearful, negative, stressed out at age 31. What changed for you? What changed was that my wife gave me the ultimatum, like, okay, change or you're off the bus. She really said, if you don't leave, if you don't, if you don't change, I'm leaving. So you better change. And I begged her to stay, agreed to change. And that began my journey. How did you take the first step? The first step was literally a prayer. And I never really prayed before like this. I just said, God, like I reached out and cried out, like, why am I here? I know a lot of people, some people don't believe in God, but I was like, you know what, God, I know you're out there. I am miserable. I'm negative. Why am I here? I know I'm here for a reason. What is it? And I kid you not, writing and speaking came to me in that moment. It was a divine experience. I mean, it wasn't like a lightning strike or anything, but it was just like this came to me and I'm like, okay. And I had this feel like that's what I'm going to do. That aha moment. Yeah, like, what am I going to write about? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. That's what I'm going to do. Ken Blanchard was one of my role models I looked up to. He went to Cornell and taught at Cornell. I went to Cornell. It's funny that he would wind up writing the forward to the energy bus, you know, my first book. I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write and speak. I didn't know what, but I have a friend to this day. He's the CEO of a company, very successful. He remembers me telling him, like, one day, like, around that time, like, I'm going to write and speak. That's what I'm going to do. And he's like, and you went and did it. it. And it was just literally, you know, it wasn't success right away, but I just said, that's what I'm going to do. And I began the step though of more so changing me 
more than trying to change the world. It started with me having to become a more positive person. That's why that chapter is called From Negative to Positive, because I had to get out there and become a better me first. So I was like taking walks of gratitude and prayer each day, just saying what I was thankful for, trying to flood my brain and body with positive emotions that uplift me. I started writing different things and you know sharing these tips at the time there wasn't newsletters back then there weren't all these blogs and 2002 i started a positive tip of the week i've done it now for 15 years i write it every week myself and i still do it every day again got to care right got to care more got to continue to That's do like it doing the laundry so to speak uh, yeah i still do the laundry but um i didn't do it then but i do it now to you know i got to show my wife i care and so i continue to do these like newsletters every week because that's what I did back then and I got to continue to show that I do it but it was like this step by step of doing the newsletter just starting out there sending it to five people then six people I then started to say hey I'm going to write and speak I started putting it out there to friends anyone who wants to talk I created a web page that just was like a picture had a news section and it was just like this is what this is what I'm doing now. And a friend reached out and said, hey, I have a friend that works for Singular Wireless. This is how long it was. Would you go speak to her team? I did. I did like 80 free talks, you know, 80 free talks just to get started. But it really helped me get better and improve as I did it. And again, I wasn't, I never thought I was going to make money from this. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to go do this. And live this life that I'm meant to live and go do what I'm meant to do. And if it, if it makes me successful over time, if it's leads to great things, then great. If not, we'll see what happens, but I'm just going to go for it. Look, when you can, when you can find an insight that other people don't know and pass it along, that feeling alone gives an adrenaline burst that you can't turn off. Yeah. As, as a speaker, you know this well, right? When you've made a difference in someone's life and, and you write as well, so you know, as you've ri- you write and speak and you can impact someone, that is the greatest feeling in the world. People always ask, what's the greatest feeling? It's not winning the lottery. I believe it's knowing that you made a difference. Yeah. Hey, there's a couple bullet point notes that I made here. And I I don't know. I don't know if you've talked to any kind of uh, Wall Street folks yet, or have gone that direction. But there's there's two two phrases, and they're not necessarily connected. But embrace failure and trust the process. You might be surprised to know that in in great trading, great Wall Street performance, embracing failure, like for example, if a trade goes against you, getting out, taking a loss, is like. It's like number one and trusting the process, meaning once you have a system or an approach, you have to stick with it regardless of the minor hiccups along the way, the, the quote whipsaws. So I, I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but I see, I see some of the, the statements in your book and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I kind of have written about this in a, in a completely different audience, but embrace failure, trust the process. Give me your feeling. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the same kind of principles for success in sports, on the trading floor, investments. You have to trust the process. You have to say, you know what? These are my strengths. These are my principles for success. You cannot lead or succeed based on circumstance, right? You have to lead and succeed based on your principles. This is how we do things. This is how I handle because those principles are your rock when circumstances change. Now, it doesn't mean you're not flexible. It's sometimes different circumstances you have to be flexible, but you lead by your principles and your process of how you do things. You know, so the print, the principle side of things is that is what you're talking about. And then what was the other one? The process and embrace, embracing, failure. Oh, embracing failure. Yeah. So embracing failure is the key to any success. Now you don't want to have, you know, too many failures. You want to learn from your failures, but it's the idea of a growth mindset that along the way, failure is an event. It's not a definition. You cannot be afraid to fail and succeed at the same time. It's an NBA player going for a shot. If you're worried about missing it, you're going to miss it. You got to be willing to go for it and to truly succeed in trading and investments. You have to be willing, right, to take some risk. It's mitigated risk, but you have to take some risk in order to succeed. I want to go into a topic, something that you brought up early in the podcast, and I, some people might not be familiar with the term. They might be able to deduce pretty quickly, pretty quickly where you're going, but energy vampire. <laughs> give, give, give the definition of the energy vampire from the John Gordon perspective. Well, it's that guy in the locker room or that teacher in the building or that person on the trading floor, that person who works in your office that just sucks the life right out of you. They're just 
a negative person. They're an energy drain. When you finish a conversation with them, you feel exhausted. That is an energy vampire. And one person can't make a team, but one person can break a team. I was speaking to the University of Georgia football team. Mark Rick brought me in to speak. And after I spoke, they lost the first two games. I thought I ruined them. He had he had the entire team read the energy bus. And then after they lost those two games, I was like, oh, man. So I sent him a text. I said, Coach, I still believe in you guys. He said, John, the guys are still on the bus. In years past, we've allowed energy vampires to sabotage our team, but not this year. This year, we will not allow it. In their big meeting room, they put a huge picture of an energy vampire on the wall. And any time one of the players was being a vampire, they took their picture from the media guy. They put it on the wall. No one wanted to be on the wall. They went on to win the next 10 games in a row, making it to the SEC championship. That team truly believed that staying positive really helped them. And a team that stays positive together wins together. And guys were going into his office saying, Coach, I'm not going to be a vampire anymore. I've been one, but I'm not going to be one anymore. And you know what? I go to companies. I've worked with some financial companies. You were mentioning that earlier. You know, I have. And you can see the guys. They just roll in their eyes. They think whatever. They don't need this positivity. You know what? They're not into it. And there's always going to be a few vampires. But I believe to create a great culture, you have to address those vampires. To create a great culture, you can't allow one negative person to sabotage your culture or your team because if they're bringing everyone else down, that's going to affect performance overall. You see football coaches do it. You see great teams do it. So I'm a big believer in making sure that you address those vampires, try to transform them, try to help them get better, help them improve. If they don't, you got to let them off the bus. That was going to be my question really was – the practical effect of dealing with an energy vampire, there's the attempt to transform, but is there a, is there a way where the audience from all the experience you've seen, is there, is there something where people, when you've got an energy vampire and they won't transform is, I mean, or is, you know, is each situation is different, but is there, is there, are there telltale signs that you've got one that's not going to transform and the only the only solution is to part ways. I think it's going through the process of trying to work with that person, talk to them, coach them, and see if they're willing to change. See if there's a change of heart. See if they're humble enough to say, you know what, I, I want to get better. And if they're not, because I mean, there were guys who are now in the NFL who were on that team at Georgia, who literally were transformed by deciding to be positive. And they talk about how it changed their life forever. I know three or four of them that I still have great relationships with. So if someone's not willing to change that, Butch Jones came to me at University of Tennessee. He said, John, he spoke to 10 of them, his vampires. Eight stayed on the bus and two got off. And he knew that those two had to get off. They were unwilling to change. So I believe you go through the process of trying to make a change, trying to impact. If they won't change, then right then and there, you know you got to let them off. So cool, though. We work with this. We have an Energy Bus for Schools program. We are transforming education through this building positive cultures and positive leaders. Started out with five model schools. Now we have 50. We're going on 100. It's unbelievable. The case studies are going to be incredible what's coming out of this. But we had one principal call us, and I have a you know a former principal, and she runs the whole thing, Nikki Spears. And she said, Nikki, she's like, I don't know what to do with this vampire. Like, I, like sh should I kick them off the bus? And Nikki said, just work through it. Try to transform it and build your culture so strong that they'll get off themselves. She goes, I don't know if that will ever happen. Well, guess what? The end of the year is happening now. That teacher came to that principal and said, you know, I just can't do this energy bus stuff anymore. I'm resigning. Like, I, I can't do it anymore. I can't stand it. Like, she couldn't stand the positivity. So she was out and she got off herself. You know what I love too? This one line here that I jotted down, don't be negative about negativity, which kind of treats it like an, an isolated cancer. This is my wording, but don't be negative about the negativity, meaning you can spot it. You can attempt to deal with it, but don't let it affect you. Just let it be something compartmentalized. Am I reading you right? I had to write that in the power of positive leadership because it's been 10 years since the energy bus has been out. Many people are discovering it for the first time, but the people that have used it, you know, over the years, some have misused it. So what they do is they say, you're either on my bus or off my bus. And that's their leadership. And it was never meant to be that way. So I have people literally emailing me saying, John, we're reading your book. My boss, that was the biggest energy vampire of all. And they're trying to promote this like it's part of 
the, the plan, part of the program. It's really hard to get those kind of emails because that was never intended to be like that. So I wrote this to say, you know what? You may have negativity, but you don't address it in a negative way. You don't be negative in that way. You have to through great leadership, through relationships, what we talked about earlier, belief and vision and and being positively contagious. Get those people on your bus by the way you lead. If they don't, then you let them off. But don't come in with this negativity thinking it's positive. One last one for you, John. I think it's a, it's a really important one for any any personal success, any team success. There's been some books written about it, but I would love for your perspective as well. And that's grit, persistence, grit. I mean, that's it's like the starting point. You've got to have it. You've got to believe. You just got to stick with it no matter what. Yeah, Angela Duckworth, foremost researcher on grit, just wrote a great book called Grit, came out. We had a conversation before her book was coming out, and I told her my thoughts on grit, asked her were they in – in you know, alignment with her research, she said yes. So I knew I was on the right track. And the key here is that, you know, as she says, grit is the number one predictor and factor of success. And every leader to succeed, as we know, will have to have grit because you're going to face adversity. You'll face challenges, the energy vampires, the naysayers. Steve Jobs was fired. Oprah was told she wasn't good enough. Elon Musk went through all the challenges right, that he had to go through to build his companies. Everyone who has this leadership opportunity will overcome challenges on their journey. So it's the grit that continues to push you forward to be successful in the long run. John, why is this perspective that you have, why is this not thrown out to freshmen in high school, freshmen in college? Why do we go these other directions that sometimes seem to be more of the, the pretend world and the real world is kept away from, from students? It's a, it's a long answer, I know, but it's, you know, I, I hear you and I'm just like, gosh, this, is, this should be indoctrination. This is like 101. I appreciate it. That's my hope. I mean, in writing this book, I mean, it's only been out for maybe a month now. So I believe that I wrote this book, my mission and passion in writing this book was that it's going to be the standard of what positive leadership is about, not Pollyanna, grounded in reality, based on research and with hope and vision, optimism and practical, right? Practical ways to lead that this will be what we will teach high school kids, college kids in business schools. That's why I combine real business examples, real coaches, real examples, a framework that we can use, create a, you know, an action plan to go with it. And, and now I'm working on an assessment that a leader could actually take to see where they stand. And then a 360 assessment where a pot, where a leader will give to their team and say, how am I doing? Am I really a positive leader like I think I am? Because we get all these leaders that think they're positive and they're not. And I also want a team to be able to say to their leader, hey, can we do this assessment with you and see if the leader will be okay with that? So I want to transform leadership and get all those horrible leaders that are really destroying cultures, ruining their teams, leading the wrong way. I want to, I want to transform those people to be more positive leaders because if they can lead better, we will have much better people, much better offices, much better buildings, companies, and really I believe it will change the world in the long run. John, you're infectious. Good stuff. The new book, The Power of Positive Leadership, How and Why Positive Leaders Transform Teams and Organizations and Change the World. John Gordon. John, I appreciate you taking some time today. Great insight. Sounds like a really fun life you've developed. I'm, I'm quite envious. I love the sports connection. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. No, I've had a, I've had a blast, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. A lot of grit and a lot of adversity and a lot of pain along the way, but I am enjoying it now. Where's the best website we can send people to, John? It's uh, johngordon.com, J-O-N gordon.com, and Twitter at J-O-N gordon11. John, I appreciate your time today. Mike, thanks so much. You're awesome. I really appreciate it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. 
I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.